Jacob loved Rachel more than uh, Leah. And it's spoken of as he loved Rachel and hated Leah. God says, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau. Do we have any trouble understanding what he means when he says that? Does that mean that he was going to persecute the children of Esau from then on? The Edomites were going to be the punished people of God, the persecuted people of God, always? No, that's not what it means. It means that he loved them less than Jacob and his descendants. Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Did he hate Leah? She was his wife, I would hope not. I've seen some relationships, I've counseled some relationships where it sure seemed like hatred, but no, that's not what it is, is it? Now, if we're going to hate our father, mother, wife, children, and ourselves, we really need to at least begin with the understanding that he's talking about love less. The word itself is very strong. The word itself is used actually only in a couple of places, but it's used a number of times. And it's used to emphasize the hatred meaning loving less, not that he actually hates or that we actually hate. But if that's the case, the explanation he gives then is, is, is unwound through the illustrations. You go out to build something. Did you figure out whether you could finish it or not? That's basically doing what? Planning ahead, isn't it? Counting the cost. He's going to ask another question. What about a feast, a wedding feast? A little bit before this. He says, uh, you go in and you uh, sit at the head of the table and then the master of the feast comes by and says, no, no, uh, uh And then you have to go down to the foot of the table, don't you? Well, that's in the same context here. Why does he give that illustration? We're supposed to be humbling ourselves before God, aren't we? There's a gradual buildup in Luke chapter 14 in which he illustrates the concepts of our relationship with God in several different ways. One is, of course, the one we just spoke of, which was the wedding feast. The other one is the building of the tower, counting the cost. He uses war as in that same concept. Plan ahead. You've got 10,000 men. Your opponent has 20,000. Can you win that battle? Then you probably better figure out a way to come to peace before you go into battle, huh? Counting the cost. There's another couple of illustrations in this as well. The master offers a feast. Nobody comes. That's embarrassing, isn't it? The master offers a wedding feast and nobody shows up. So he says, well, go out and get anybody but those who we invited originally. They come back and say, master, we did, and there's still room. He says, then go out and get the uh, the highways and byways, get the halt, lame, and the, the blind, and bring them in. Why would you bring in the outcasts of society? Why would you bring in the ones that are marred by God? Because the ones who are invited refuse to accept. Now, we usually interpret that one in particular in terms of the Jews. The Jews were invited, but they didn't accept it, so he had to go out and get the Gentiles. That's a little overstated, but that's kind of the way we approach that interpretation. But the fact is, what he intends is, I've made an invitation to you, and I expect you to be faithful in attending that. Now, you and I look at these passages and say, man, this is hard talk. Let me give a quick uh, opinion about what I think he does sometimes. The crowd gets too big. He's got a short time to do his work. The crowd gets too big, so what does he do? He says something hard to run a few of them off. And maybe not always just a few of them, but a lot of them sometimes. Maybe this is one of those type of moments. If you don't hate yourself, your father, mother, wife, sisters, etc., etc., then you cannot be my disciple. Maybe that's what he's really doing here. He's running some people off. He's saying, pay attention to what you're actually doing when you follow me. Not all the time did they understand what they were doing, and they, he would respond with a question back to them. Um, how about the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler calls him good rabbi, and he says what? Well, there's nobody good but God. Why are you calling me good? Now we, in our modern time, we look back on that and say, well, that's because he was God, wasn't he? In the flesh. But this uh, 
young ruler wouldn't have understood that. So what, what was he asking him? Do you understand what you're calling me? And we go back and we explain that. We understand those kind of things. But here he says something hard. How about when Nicodemus came to him? Nicodemus came to him and says, uh, we know you're from God because you couldn't do the things you're doing unless you were from God. But what must I do to enter the kingdom of God? And then he gives them this response that's at best obtuse. You must be born again. So Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus' response is, can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? That's not what I'm talking about. But you must be born again. We see those kinds of things. We say he's challenging people all the time, isn't he? He may not always be saying the easiest and sweetest and the nicest. You guys know some of the preachers on uh, television that have this nice, wonderful, no challenges Christianity they preach. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. They'll publish books, you know, the seven prayers you should say over yourself so that you can have happiness, wealth, and blessings from God. I don't see Jesus doing that much, do you? Instead, I hear him saying, you cannot be my disciple. And among other things. But let's take a few moments. A parallel passage to this, and it's not really quite parallel, is in Matthew chapter 10. But let's look at verse 14, 26 for a moment, and then go on. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, instead of explaining a way cannot be my disciple, we need to embrace the statement as it is given by the Holy Spirit and try to understand why a person cannot be his disciple. So let's go back up there. It says, if anyone comes to me. Um, that's a conditional word, isn't it? If. Now, we do find if translated in English out of the original language, which sometimes the emphasis, based on context and based on the word itself, is not really if, but rather since. But in this case, it is definitely the if, the conditional if. If you come to me, that means you have a choice. Are you going to come to me or not? But if you come to me, you must what? Hate your father and mother. That's a horrible gospel, isn't it? If that's exactly where it ends, but it doesn't end there, does it? Go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Do not think that I come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a what? A sword. Now, we don't use swords much today, and that's pretty good because I hate cutting instruments of all kinds. But Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those in his own household. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. Your enemies will be those of your own household. Why? Well, basically it's that old phrase, some will, some won't. And when some won't, sometimes there's conflict. So when an individual comes to the uh, Lord and the family does it, what happens? Sometimes what happens is the family tries to keep him from being faithful to the Lord. Do you ever know anybody like that? You ever know somebody had a family? Maybe your family situation was like that. And sometimes the conflict is so great. We know of instances, for example, where the family has disowned a uh, child in the family or another family member because of their faith in Jesus. We've even perhaps known of other situations where the family would kill the family member who turned to Christ. And we're more aware of that in our modern time because of some of the things happening over in the Middle East. But the fact is, this has been something that occasionally has happened throughout history, hasn't it? You might literally have put your life at risk by coming to Christ. But Jesus is here telling them that's what he came to do, was to create that division, if you will, to create that conflict Come to me, and that has to be the priority. Verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. By the way, we could stop right there. We could take Luke 14, 26, and then put Matthew 10, verse 37 with it. And the preacher could uh, hush and sit down, but I'm going to take a few more minutes. Is that okay? Or don't answer that. I'm going to take a few more minutes. Let's just leave it at that, Okay. If you don't love your Lord most, but you love somebody here on earth enough to be able to cause, um, 
My wife told me once, boy, she's mean. She says, I'm not going to let you keep me from heaven. Is that the attitude that we're supposed to have? Even with someone we love, I thought love covered everything. Love took care. Didn't that what he said back in the 60s when he sang that all we need is love? No, we need a little more than that, don't we? What we need is truth, faithfulness, obedience. We need to go to the Lord and be totally committed to the Lord. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength? That was probably the most copied scripture out of the Old Testament by the Jewish people. Because they thought literally they had to write that passage out, roll it up into a little uh, scroll, and put it in a little uh, satchel or a little container and bind it across their forehead. That's kind of missing the point, I think, really. But they would write that down and put it in there. I think what it means is we need to keep it in front of us and it needs to be the focus of our life. What's our priority? You know, if I'm going to count the cost... um, I should have thought of that before I got married and had kids, right? Anybody in here ever thought that? Maybe I should go back and do that differently? Well, no, we don't really mean that because our love is so great for our family that we don't really ever quite think that way. But counting the cost, any of you in here can honestly say you really knew what to expect when you got married and had kids and grandkids and whatever, and that you had fully committed to it was no question, but... Did you really understand what it was going to cost? I've heard guys who went through boot camp, initial trainings for military service. They said that was the most strenuous, the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I would never do it again, but I'm glad I went through it once. I'm kind of figuring that way about marriage too, but uh, no offense any. But the idea of commitment is really the key, isn't it? If we knew exactly what it was that we had to do for the Lord we might be a little hesitant to actually commit ourselves. I'm fascinated by the idea of what Jesus calls these people to do. He's he's telling them a little bit of what might happen. Now, he's not pointing to an individual and saying, your father's going to hate you. Are you sure you want to follow me? He's not doing that. He's throwing it out there in a more general fashion. But he's asking that, isn't he? And then comes Saul of Tarsus. And Jesus says, Saul, I've got a job for you. Saul is, of course, astonished because God is talking to him himself. He's astonished because he's been chosen special. He's also astonished because he was actually persecuting the church. And Jesus comes and says, taps him on the shoulder and says, tag, you're it. But then Jesus says this. He says, you're not going to die until you have preached the gospel of the kingdom to the emperor of the world. How many of you guys like public speaking? You're okay getting up here in front of a group and and speaking, right? Yeah, there's a lot of you that don't like that, right? Yeah, what if you were told that you would have to become a public speaker in order to uh, be faithful to Jesus? Anybody else, anybody in here had that happen to them? Okay. But what if you were told that public speaking wouldn't be to a group of uh, nobodies like us here in Rio Ranchos? I'm sorry, common folk like us here in Rio Rancho. It would be before the leaders of the world. I don't know about you, but that would intimidate me pretty good. Before I started the journey being told that I would have to go and preach before the Caesar. Now, you've got to remember, it's a little bit different back then than what it is now. I would suspect that most uh, political leaders in our world today, not in all maybe, but most, would be at least polite on the surface At least they would act like it was nice to see you here. Thank you for coming and sharing what you believe with me. Uh, Not quite as uh, strong as what we see perhaps with the Caesar of the world at that time who had the right of life and death over them. The ability to kill them if they didn't like what they heard. And by the way, the name of the emperor when Paul went to Rome to be in prison initially was what? who again? Nero. Nero. Now, there's the icon of sanity in Rome, if I ever heard one. God says, you're going to go preach to Nero. I am not. Then you cannot be my disciple. Okay. God has not asked you to go preach to Nero, has he? He hasn't asked you to preach to Obama. He hasn't asked you to preach to Netanyahu. 
He hasn't asked you to preach to any other world leader in this world today. He has asked you to be his disciple here now in this community, in this neighborhood, in this life that you live. And I believe he does ask us to preach that word in our lives as well. But the fact is, it's not a dangerous task that he's given us, at least not for most of us. Now, I might get ridiculed. I, uh, I sometimes joke about uh, persecution, the church being persecuted. Yeah, I, I was persecuted the other day. Somebody called me a name because I was a Christian. Uh, doesn't quite have the same feel for it as Paul being stoned to death outside of uh, a city in, in Asia. That doesn't quite have the same feel for it as uh, beaten with rods over and over and over and over again like Paul was. Doesn't have quite the weight of, of uh, impact as uh, being thrown in jail to possibly be killed. It doesn't have quite the same impact as we hear of some today who have been persecuted physically, emotionally, and sometimes in other ways, and even to the point of death. But Jesus says, are you willing to pay the price or do you love yourself more than me? Now see, loving father and mother, that's one thing. Brothers and sisters, well, that's different. They're brothers and sisters, right? Yeah, well, we love our brothers and sisters, don't we? Are you willing to die for them? Yeah, I guess we are, aren't we? Mostly. Not willing to talk to them all the time, but I'm willing to die for them, right? It's kind of one of those paradoxes of our lives, right? But the fact is we love them. How about our children? Until they become teenagers, we love them to death, don't we? But the fact is, we love our kids, and we want the best for them. Jesus says, do you love me more than your own children? Boy, that's tough. Do you love me more than yourself? You see, I'm willing to raise my hand when I say, yeah, I'm willing to die for Jesus. I'm kind of like Peter, I guess, in that regard. I'm not saying that I'm like Peter in all the other regards, but at least in this regard. Peter, as long as he had a sword in his hand, was more than willing to die for Jesus, right? When Jesus said, put the sword away, Jesus, uh, Peter had trouble. And I think that's one of the reasons he records the denials that Peter gives that night. He was willing to die for Jesus until Jesus told him to put the weapon down. Because he wanted him to live for him instead. So you're one of his disciples, aren't you? Not me. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? No way. I saw you with him. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? Curse, 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 no way. Why? Peter was making that transition of faith that said, am I willing to die for him, really, or not? And that's tough. They, they talk about the distinction between the apostles before he died on the cross and afterward. And I, I think it's a fascinating study just to think about. And it is basically a mental exercise. But we can go through and see some of the evidences, can't we? Jesus is harsh, mostly to his disciples. He says, O ye of little faith, more often than not, to the twelve that were following him than he does to anybody else. But after his resurrection, what do we see? We see men who believed in Jesus prior to his death, burial, and resurrection, but after his death, burial, and resurrection were in a different level of commitment. Think about it. We watched him die. He said he would rise again, and sure enough, he did. The resurrected Lord is a power in their lives that is different for them to the extent that records, mythologies, call them whatever you will, but the stories concerning what happened to those men where the scripture does not give it to us, indicates that 11 of the 12 men died in a persecuted fashion. Some very horribly. I'm not sure whether it's really all that significant, whether you die sweetly or horribly when it's persecution, but the fact is some of them died very badly, didn't they? But as faithful men, they didn't deny Jesus again, did they? They stood up and says, we must do what God tells us. And that's the cost. 
That's what really the cost is. You don't have to hate your father and mother. If they want to keep you from your faith, then you have to at least not allow your relationship with them to get in the way of your faith and your relationship with God. But it is not a matter of us hating our wives and our, our sisters and our brothers. It's not even a matter of hating ourselves. It's a matter of loving God more. And so what we have is we have scripture that says that. Matthew 10 verse 37 that we just read. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What does it mean then he cannot be my disciple? If you don't love me more than your mother and father, then you cannot be my disciple. The opposite of that is true. If you love me more than mother, father, wife, husband, sister, brother, then you can be my disciple. That's not really a hard saying that much. But if you hear it one way, you say, okay, we can't be, but I don't want to listen to anything he says if he says I can't be his disciple. Well, then, don't love the world more than you love him. And by the way, that's, that's really where it goes. Uh, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This is before they understood that he was going to the cross. And especially the crowds. They didn't always understand that, but they understood it as a burden. They may have even understood it as a burden that might lead to death, so there was a little bit of that counting the cost there. But look at uh, chapter 14, Luke 14, verse 33. Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you don't renounce everything you have, you cannot be, no, be, be my disciple. Um, I asked a question in an, in an audience once, this is a few years ago, and it said, is God going to ask you to get rid of everything you have and, uh, and follow him? And somebody said, well, he, he would never ask that of us. Uh, wait a minute, is that because we're Americans? Or because we're American Christians? Or because we have so much? The rich young ruler was told to sell everything he has in order to be able to be, uh, follow Jesus. And he went away sorrowful because he had a lot of stuff. Do you have a lot of stuff that's keeping you between you and Jesus? Do you have a lot of stuff that's keeping you from following him the way he wants you to? Hating father and mother, hating my car, my house. See, it's not a matter of hate. It's a matter of letting these physical things get in the way of our relationship with the spiritual God. Jesus is our Lord. We're supposed to set apart Christ as Lord in our lives. You know what the word Lord means? It means master. I'm supposed to be the slave. Jesus is supposed to be the master. But I'm American. We aren't slaves of anybody. Well, apparently the scripture says we're slaves of something. Slave to ourselves or slaves to Christ. It's up to us. We're slaves to Satan or we're slaves to God. Righteousness or iniquity. It's our choice. But we need to be servants of God. So he says, hate your father and mother. Matthew 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other, or vice versa, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money or material things, or as the Old Testament, old uh, King James says, what's that word, mammon? How many of you guys use the word mammon in common English language today anywhere? No? Okay. He does. Nobody else does. You can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and yourself. You can't serve both God and your family. You know, preachers have a bad time with this. We uh, probably have the highest incidence of divorce rate, they say, as a general pattern of profession. And uh, high, high, about as high an incident as anybody of, of trouble with family, with kids, and, and marital relations, various other things. And, and we're shocked by that. Well, when you realize some of these guys say, well, I've got to serve God. I'm doing God's work. I've got to do God's work more than anything. You know, part of God's work is loving your wife, taking care of your family, being the man of God in the lives of these people that you're most intimate with. Preachers get out of balance sometimes that way. And sometimes I've seen Christians in the church do that as well, where they get so caught up, and I've got to do this, 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 and they get busy doing the things that have really little to do with what God put them here for. 
What does a man gain if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Can you take it with you? What would you do with the whole world if you had it with you anyway? Just a question. The idea that we have something so precious being offered to us, if we'll just make him the priority. And then we argue, well, if he doesn't want me on my terms, he, he, he's not good enough to be my God. Now, maybe you've heard it in those terms or close to those terms, but we've heard it a lot, haven't we? I've heard it in actually those ways. God has to do it my way or else. Do you realize how big God is? Do you realize who we're talking about here? And Jesus is talked about in the same fashion. John in John chapter 1, Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1. Who is this son that he says he goes through today? He's the creator of the universe. He's the one who upholds everything by his power. He's the one who is in all and through all and whom we all owe our existence. The story is uh, written uh, recently, and a guy tells about an incident with a taxi cab driver. <coughs> and I, I don't know whether it was in New York City or whether it was in Addis Ababa or whatever, but it was a, a, a Muslim-type uh, guy, I believe it was, and he's, so he gets talking and says, uh, what happens after you die? He says, well, I haven't sinned very badly, so I'll probably go into torment for a little while to pay for my sins I've committed, and then I'll be let out and be in uh, heaven. Oh, isn't that nice? Uh, why? Well, I haven't sinned that badly. You haven't. Well, let's think about that for a minute. What would you do if I slapped you in your taxi cab? He says, I'd kick you out of my cab. What if I slapped somebody on the sidewalk over there? Says, they may beat you up, but it might call the police. What if I slapped a policeman? He says, then you would be beaten up and put in jail. What if I slapped the king? You'd die. <laughs> Now, what's the difference? It's just a slap. Have you ever heard people say that about uh, sin? It's just a slap. It's just sex. It's just a little bit. It's just whatever. See, the difference wasn't the act. The difference was who the act was done to. Now, this taxi cab driver got the point. He says, yeah, there's a difference between slapping the king and slapping me. And who is it that we are dishonoring when we sin against God? We're dishonoring the God of the universe. We're talking about some being that is so great, so immense, so grand, that our awareness of him is, is really just a very small bit. And yet we make excuses, well, my sins aren't that bad. I haven't done that bad. I really am a good person. Just ask me. Yeah, you probably are. Matthew 10, verse 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. <coughs> Counting the cost is not the easiest thing in the world, is it? Counting the cost is kind of nebulous because we point out there and say, well, if I ever have to, I am willing to. And then whatever it is, we finish the sentence with. But we don't know until we're put in that position, do we? I remember when my wife and I had been married a whole, I don't know, eight, nine, ten months, maybe a little less than a year. We heard some noise in the night, middle of the night, and uh, scared us to death. Well, it scared me to death. She wasn't scared. It's because she had me there to protect her, right? Yeah, a lot of good that would have done her. Get up and check it out what it is. I was terrified. You know, 19, 20 years old, and I thought for sure I was the big bad man in the world. We don't know until we find out by something happening. Well, as it turned out, it was next door, drunk, coming home, a little noisy. No big deal. But it could have been something else, couldn't it? We don't know until it comes up to us. And when that does happen, we don't even know why we do what we do necessarily when it happens. But sometimes we have to respond in a certain way. Courageous and with firmness and strength 
and honor even when we're scared to death. I don't know what God has in, in front of us. Will he ask us to ever deny him by literally deny him or die as was done early in the church's history and is being done in other parts of the world right now? I don't know. He hasn't asked me yet. But I need to count the cost ahead of time. And if I'm not willing to at least be put in a position where that could happen, and then to at least commit myself to saying, I will serve God anyway. I cannot be his disciple, even now without that coming up. He asks a lot of us, but he's in a position to ask a lot of us, isn't he? He asks a lot of us because he is God and can. He asks a lot of us because he's God and he feels he should. He asked a lot of us because he paid a price that was a lot for us, didn't he? And with that price that he paid, we cannot ever pay him back. But his love was great enough that he gave it to us anyway. And so he asked a lot of us. He says, I gave you my life for my son, my one and only son. All I'm asking you is to give your life, your lowly, pitiful, worthless life for the life of his son. Is that really too much for God to ask of us? So he cannot be my disciple unless he does what? He loves God first. That's really the story. Love me first. The rest of it, yes, love all these, but you can't love them without loving me first. And I love you so you can love in the first place. So love me first. You cannot be my disciple unless you love God above all.